Hey folks. So my name is Vladimir Velikov. I'm a senior engineer in the vSphere client team. I'm focused on SDK and plugins. Uh, so today we'll be talking about uh, vSphere in VMware Cloud, but especially the vSphere client, uh, which is common for both of them and uh, the integration with this via plugins. So our agenda is uh, we'll just go through what is possible to extend in the HTML client, which, uh, as you know, is fully featured since 6.7 update 1, which got released recently. And we will uh, check uh, what's the life cycle of a plugin, what stage it just it goes through to be installed. Uh, we'll see what issues there might be there, how to cope with them. And then we'll have a look into the future. So basically, the extensibility of the vSphere client falls into two categories, like context-specific and context-less. The context-less one uh, we call global extensions. So those are global views, essentially the ability of a partner solution to integrate uh, their dashboards into the client, um, their custom workflows, whatever they have, taking uh, advantage of the most of the, uh, of the space area of the vSphere client. And then uh, they also have a single entry point for uh, their navigation uh, in the object navigator or the main menu. Uh, with regards to uh, context-specific extensions, this, uh, this is actually extensions uh, that show up when you select a particular inventory object. So commonly that's the, uh, having an additional uh, summary section view, that's a portlet on the summary page where uh, only uh, short summarized uh, information uh, is recommended, which would normally link to a more detailed monitor or configure uh, uh, pages, uh, which, uh, as you can see, are um, grouped into uh, a separate category per each plugin. And in addition to that, um, there's the possibility to uh, extend uh, the menu with new actions, which can be two types. Um, headless actions, the ones that uh, are executed immediately when the user clicks. Uh, for example, those are like uh, virtual ma machine power on or off. Uh, or the other possibility is uh, opening another UI, which is uh, model dialog or, uh, or a wizard, uh, where the user input needs to be captured before executing the operation. For example, creating a VM. So let's see how this actually happens. Uh, on, on the diagram, you see at the bottom the vCenter. Uh, in blue and in green, uh, uh, those are um, partner uh, delivered virtual appliance and installer. And uh, on top you see the vSphere client with its uh, application server. Normally the client is part of vCenter, of course, uh, but it might be uh, living on another vCenter, it might be even running standalone. So, in, uh, so for our purposes, we consider it as a separate uh, actor in this diagram. Now, first the plugin is uh, hosted. Um, then uh, when the, uh, the, the administrator runs the installer, it would register an entry with the vCenter extension manager, indicating that uh, there is a, a new plugin to be installed. Uh, the IDN version uh, show um, uniquely what this plugin is, and there's a URL where to download it from. Uh, so when the user logs in, the whole process is triggered, uh, and uh, the client goes to all vCenters in the environment and checks uh, the registration data from the extension managers and collects what plugins need to be fetched. So we, uh, we get uh, the, the extension info for our plugin. 
and the plugin gets downloaded from this URL. What happens next is uh, a certification check. Uh, there's a certification program uh, run by VMware where partners can uh, certify their plugins, and this is visible on the UI. This is not a reason for um, uh, like failing the plugin uh, in the client. It will be operational, working, and so on, uh, but it will show as uh, not uh, certified by VMware. Then uh, we unzip and we do a check for compatibility. So once uh, we know the plugin is compatible, its bundles are being deployed into the application server, first the service and all, all the, the Java bundles and then the UI. And in the end, the plugin shows up. So essentially, this is kind of pretty straightforward. Uh, workflow, but it, uh, there are places where it can go wrong, and uh, as the rule goes, it does go wrong <laughs> in uh, those places. So let's see uh, what problems uh, there have been. Uh, normally, they are they can be seen in the uh, vSphere client Virgo log, but this uh, it's big. So we've seen that it's not always too easy for, uh, for people to get around what's going on and what's failing. Um, so first problem that might be encountered. So uh, generally, uh, what uh, users usually say is, I just uh, upgrade vCenter, or I start uh, the client, and the plugin is not there. So there are various reasons why that could be. So this is the first one. Plugin is not even registered, so uh, the way to verify this is going to the managed, ob managed ob object browser, check the extension manager, and see if there's an entry. Uh, so, if we assume there's an entry, next thing that could fail is the actual download. So, uh, first thing to check is uh, does this plugin zip actually exist on this URL. It might be that the IP is wrong or the, the location is uh, not correct. If uh, you're able to open it in a browser, then the next thing to check is uh, does the client actually have uh, the, the permissions to download this? And uh, uh, this is usually handled by a server thumbprint, um, uh, which is part, uh, like registration, which is part of the uh, extension info uh, when uh, the plugin is getting registered as a vCenter extension. So if we manage to download it uh, successfully, next uh, probable culprit is the uh, fact it might not be compatible. So if we try to deploy a Flex plugin or uh, a, a plugin uh, that supports different versions of the client, this is where uh, it will be reported as not compatible and not deployed. Or it might be that um, it is a plugin that's known uh, for misbehaving on this particular version of the client, so uh, some uh, master administrator might have blacklisted it so that others don't run into issues. So for that, uh, you check uh, the compatibility matrix. And if it goes, uh, the compatibility checks, it might fail during deployment. Now, there, is a, there are lots of uh, possible reasons for that. Commonly, OSGI dependencies, um, um, not being able to load content at the right time, stuff like that. Um, so for that, you really need to look at the logs. And uh, generally, this is not the ideal troubleshooting scenario, but it's a start. So it's important to look into what VMware has focused on to improve the situation over uh, the last release. So basically, uh, since the beginning of the HTML client, um, those are only improvements on the HTML client. Flash client uh, doesn't have this. So we provided tooling for uh, the partners to, um, 
to know better how to register. Um, probably you, you've seen that with the Flash client, there were times when uh, you would uh, log in forever. And this was mostly because um, plugins, all plugins had to be downloaded before the UI sh uh, shows up. And if there are issues, sometimes the client wouldn't even start. So with the async deployment, uh, the UI is operational. You can use it. And in the, bank, in the background, all plugins are getting deployed, like downloaded, deployed, go through the whole process. And once that's complete, you, you see the banner uh, that you need to refresh to be able to make use of those plugins. We also, uh, I mentioned already the compatibility matrix possibility if, if you know, if you see that the plugin is failing to blacklist it. Um, and we also added the, uh, the possibility for you to check uh, the quality of plugins that are currently running. And that's also, uh, that can be visible in the plugin medic log. But that, that's also very helpful for the plugin developer who is seeing uh, dev time that there are issues and they can improve before this happens in production. But by far the best feature we implemented is the OSGI sandboxing. So this essentially enables each plugin to run in, in its own dependency scope, which means that one plugin cannot consume libraries delivered by another plugin which was the most common uh, problem uh, during plugin deployment. So with this uh, feature, uh, about 90% uh, of the issues that uh, we've seen coming from uh, during deployment have gone. So at the moment when uh, there's a bug arriving at my desk re uh, regarding um, uh, dependencies, I'm like, it's flex, right? <laughs> So going forward, we, we don't plan to stop here. We are currently, there's nothing written in stone at the moment, but we are uh, evaluating uh, possibilities to make troubleshooting a lot easier through the UI and not you having to go through configurations and um, logs and stuff like that. So now, what does the future hold? And when I'm saying the future, I mean the present, because the new remote plugin architecture has been released as of uh, 6, 7, update 1. And uh, we even have our architect here. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, what rem uh, are remote plugins about? So let's uh, have a comparison between local and remote plugins. Uh, you have more or less the same picture. So on the left, you have the local plugin uh, with the uh, partner appliance and partner installer. Again, uh, the Java service is deployed from the appliance, and the UI is served from, uh, from this Java bundle. In the opposite direction, the UI commun communicates with its backend through the, the same Java bundle. So in, in essence, uh, this Java middle layer acts as a kind of proxy in the, sim in the simplest uh, scenario. But sometimes uh, it's, re it's required a more um, complicated routing logic, especially with multiple dissenters. So how does remote plugins, uh, how do remote plugins uh, change this? You again have a registration. This time you don't register zips. You register just one plugin JSON uh, manifest, which only indicates the extensions that uh, this plugin is going to show on the UI. So there's nothing deployed on the vCenter, which is very important. So when the user interacts with the UI, the UI is served directly from the backend server. A lot more straightforward. And in the opposite direction, the UI talks directly to the backend server through the reverse proxy of the vCenter. So why is this important? 
it is important well for this this field yes but the left part of this picture is a no-go for VMware cloud on, on AWS you just can't allow running external bits on a public cloud right so remote plugins are the way to go both for vSphere but especially for the VMware cloud so if we have to compare uh, the two I mentioned the executable bits so the actual issues that occur with uh, with the old model is that um, uh, well it can degrade performance because of the extra hops to the back end and waiting times and so on but uh, um, in this case the, the plugin is uh, actually using the resources of the client so you never know when uh, when you'll be out of memory or other uh, issues and also upgrades could be failing uh, that's not possible with remote plugins. It might be that the, after an, a, a vCenter upgrade, it might be that the plugin is not operational, but it will not impact the upgrade itself, which is a very common pain point. And um, the special thing about remote plugins and, and the value it adds is uh, also the multi-version and multi-instance support. So what, what does this mean? Uh, here we have another uh, picture, wildly, uh, wildly different versions of vCenter, 6.0 on the left, 6.7 on the right, and 9.8. I, I don't know when this uh, is going to happen, <laughs> but uh, that's some future version of a vCenter, let's imagine. Uh, and they're connected to three different backends. So in the local plugin scenario, we get only one plugin deployed on the vSphere client that has to talk to all these backends. It means that uh, when there is a new version, all partners will have to provide a new version of the plugin that's actually, that's actually able to talk to, to their latest backend, but also to all the old backends. And this is increasingly difficult for all partner solutions to, to comply with, so they're cutting back on the supported versions from their side. Now, with remote plugins, we just have each plugin backend serving, uh, serving its own uh, instance of the UI. Uh, so what you see on the left V1 and on the right V1, that's not a typo. It means that two different plugin uh, servers might uh, provide and serve the, the same plugin version, but a different instance of it. And this is important because this way you can upgrade separately each of those without Im impacting uh, the other. And in, in the opposite direction, they talk directly to the particular backend server that's attached uh, to the respective vCenter. So let's have a look at uh, uh, the, uh, the case of enhanced and hi uh, hybrid link mode. So we, we have three vCenters. Um, they're standalone at the moment. First one has a local and a remote plugin. Second one has uh, the same plugins but with higher versions and an additional uh, local plugin. And the third one has just one remote plugin. So what the user would see in the client would be this. So, uh, well, that's expected. You, you go to uh, the particular managed object and you see the plugins populating there. Now, what happens when we link those using enhanced, enhanced link mode? So essentially, this. On the first picture, you see that the, uh, uh, that the uh, local plugin L1 is now 
provided by the higher version 1.1, which was downloaded from vCenter 2. So here the assumption is that L1 with, uh, um, with version 1.1 is able to, to communicate. It's, yeah, it's able to communicate to both. And the rest is the same. Uh, so we have uh, each remote plugin on all the three pictures. It's just the version that's attached to this particular vCenter. Logical, right? And for in the second picture, uh, the local plugins are also um, are, are also the versions that are attached to vCenter 2 because they are the latest ones. Now, let's enhance a bit further this uh, uh, picture of enhanced link mode. So what if we have the first two vCenters in separate SSO domains? Uh, in, in, a, in one SO domain and uh, uh, the vCenter 3 in another SO domain. Well, first, the, the second uh, ELM connection is no longer possible. But in this case, if the left one is the private cloud and the right one is the public cloud, we can establish a hybrid link mode. And here the important question is what changes in, in terms of how this is displayed in the client? And the answer is nothing. So SSO domains don't bring complexity into the plugin story, uh, especially with remote plugins that's even uh, easier. So you, you can uh, easily consider that uh, you don't have these boundaries. Now, uh, of course, uh, if you log into the cloud, you might, mean, you might not be able to see certain vCenters, which is fine, but if you see a vCenter, you are certain that you will get exactly the plugins that are uh, applicable to it. So basically, that was it from me. Um, you can see some uh, details, some official documentation for writing plugins. If you want to write plugins, of course, uh, I encourage you to contact uh, the SDK team or myself personally. We also have a blog and uh, we are daily at the forum. Um, so it's a really good place to contact us. We usually answer within, uh, <laughs> within the same day. Um, and of course, you can uh, contact me or tweet me anytime. Do you have any questions? I threw lots of uh, data at you, <laughs> I guess. Thanks a lot, folks.